Okay, everybody. Well, uh, welcome back to this uh, um, this second part. Uh, I'll try not to make this overrun too much this time. Um, so we're in the Renaissance period this time, and as I said last uh, on the last presentation, it's kind of arguable when the uh, Middle Ages ended and the uh, Renaissance started. So just for argument's sake, we're saying fourteen fifty. Uh, everybody seems to be in agreement that it's uh, it finished in 1600 to make way for the Baroque period. So, yeah, uh, the basic changes since uh, the Middle Ages. Um, no instruments at this, these times were mass-produced, but there was a bit more sort of uh, focus in how instruments were produced and made a bit more to spec, if you like. Um, so they were more actual uh, standardised, etc. The, the different instruments. There's obviously some older instruments that survived uh, into this period, and some new instruments as well. Um, okay, so we did actually have the uh, modern scaling, uh, etc. I've just jumped ahead a wee bit too much there, but uh, <coughs> the modern scaling instead of the modes. Uh, so things are a bit more palatable. There's none of these strange clashes, etc. But at this sort of period, we're not talking mega complex uh, pieces in regards to chord structures. It were mainly sort of majors and minors, and there's a lot of sort of kind of predictable chord progressions uh, in, in this sort of period. Um, <coughs> one of the reasons I chose a particular date to suggest um, that the Renaissance starting at this point was this particular composer, uh, Josquin Dupré, or if you're from Doncaster, Josquin Despres. Um, the thing about this this particular composer, he uh, he kind of pioneered the changes, really. Um, he wasn't the first composer to do um, take a, a Gregorian chant piece and then build vocals all around it, because remember, Gregorian chant was known as playing song, everybody would just sing a single part. Um, he wasn't the first composer to actually build uh, you know, take a Gregorian chant piece and then build around it. But what he did do a lot more of was uh, he experimented a lot more. Uh, so there's quite a uh, quite a complex but really nice intricate uh, example in this in this excerpt I've got. So hopefully I'm going to play this now, and it, you should be able to hear it. So give me a shout if you don't. Okay, we could obviously play that forever because it is quite a, a, a nice, intricate piece. Uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. It reminded me a bit of Mozart's Requiem, some of it. Yeah, well, yeah, entirely. It's well, I mean, that's that's the thing about it. Yeah, there's lots of influences from this time, but uh, yeah, um, just Josquin Dupré seemed to be uh, one of the most experimental out of the out of the people. I'm not saying I'm a big scholar on composers, etc., but. Uh, uh, Thomas Tallis was another one uh, who, if you've seen the Tudors, uh, he was, yeah, Thomas Tallis featured uh, quite a bit on there. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, now we're talking about consorts of instruments. Now, obviously, the word consort in some ways suggests some, some kind of rudery. Um, but in, in this case, it is talking about basically in the Renaissance period, you had different uh, sizes of the same instrument, whereas in the Middle Ages, you, you tended not to have that. You probably have one Rebec size of a Rebec, you've had one size of um, sit all, etc., uh, one size Gitten, and, and all those kind of instruments. But uh, yeah, so. When we've got consorts of instruments, here we've got uh, the idea of the uh, recorder. Now, I did speak about these in the last one, but I think I think you actually you said about an instrument looking like a recorder. This was the sort of heyday because we've got a nice consort of uh, recorders here. There are actually seven sizes in total. Uh, so you'd start from the, the great bass, then the bass, the tenor, alto, soprano, sopranino, and then galkline floyton, which is, <laughs> translates as very small flute. But uh, on the, uh, the the lower ones, the basser instruments, the basser, the bass instruments, there was an actual key on the bottom to make it humanly possible to cover the, the, uh, the bottom hole, as it were. Um, so what we've got here, we've got a, a nice excerpt of soprano, alto, tenor and bass. Uh, they were the usual combinations that you'd get in any consort. So here we go. So, other instruments. You may have heard of these called crumb horns. Uh, they look like little walking sticks or umbrellas. Uh, these are uh, an outside, an outdoor instrument, uh, a reed instrument, but the, the, the difference here is, uh, apart from them being curved, is that the, uh, the reed is housed inside a wind cap, so you don't physically make contact with the reed itself. Um, they do have a kind of a... Um, a buzzy sound and so when you've got a consort of them together uh, you do get a sort of a nice little crisp harmony Okay, now we've had shawms before. We had the, the shawm in the Middle Ages, uh, doing that quite ear-splitting uh, uh, recording uh, that we had. Um, these are outdoor instruments as well, but they are actually a lot louder than crumb horns. Um, these are, are sort of a conical bore, and you will probably figure in this one how they actually sound a bit more like uh, oboes. Uh, the main sizes again were soprano, alto, tenor and bass and that's what you're going to hear in this excerpt. Uh, there were also larger ones called contra bass and great bass. Uh, there was also one higher than soprano called sopranino as well, but that give you an headache actually. So um, here we are, we've got a nice uh, excerpt again of a, uh, a consort of Sean's.
as they fade out. <laughs> okay, now then, um, if you think the shawms are loud as an, exter an outdoor instrument, <clears throat> this instrument is the Rausch Pfeiffer. Um, this is a wind cap, kind of wind capped shawm, as you can see there. I can only find a picture of two of them together. But uh, in this example, yeah, these are a, a bit more punchy than a shawm. They're not as quite as air splitting, but they do have a, a very, uh, a very sort of punchy uh, sound. So yeah, the the, the pronounced pronunciation is Rausch Pfeiffer, and uh, more than one is Rausch Pfeiffer. So here we go. Try saying that when you had a couple of pints. <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> well, that's it, yeah. Yeah, so it is a consort of Michelle's. Okay, now this is a, a kind of a re an introduction and, and a reintroduction of, of an instrument, this one. This is an instrument known as a kirtle. Uh, the reason it's called that is basically, for things like the shawm, uh, your su sort of soprano, alto and tenor kind of sizes were okay to handle, but the larger ones like the bass, contra bass and great break bass would involve people actually having to stand on a table to, to play them uh, because they were so long. And um, so what, what they had the idea of, which is kind of a, uh, an ancestor to the modern bassoon, is to sort of double the tube back on itself. So it's, this instrument is actually crafted so that uh, you can see you blow down the top of the shawm and the actual talent sound comes out of the top as well, so that the bell of the instrument is actually facing upwards. So it's, it's wooden, but it's crafted in the fact that the tube goes down and then back up on itself and it's bound there by leather. Um, so yeah, technically, they're not, the, they're not a new instrument. They are a sort of a, 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 a bent shawm, a folded shawm. And the word kirtle, you'll have heard the word curtail to either say docking a, a, a dog uh, or a horse, or, but it just means to cut short. So that's what they've actually done here with the, the kirtle. Uh, a consort of kirtles actually, to me, I think actually sounds slightly different from a shawm or a consort of shawms. It's a slightly less uh, powerful sound, uh, which in a way gives it a, an identity of its own. So you might notice there's a kind of a, a consistency of how the melodies go and the chord progressions. It's very typical. You can really quite identify with Renaissance when the, that type of thing happens. Um, okay, another similar instrument. This is a court halt, and it's the same principle as a kirtle, uh, is in the uh, the reed double back on its uh, the pipe double back on itself. Uh, and, but this one's got, it's a wind capped instrument and you get the extra holes, etc. get to give you uh, the additional note range, but these actually do sound quite low uh, compared to the kirtle.
Okay, so doubling the uh, the tube back on itself were a clever enough idea uh, in the first place, but now we've got an instrument that does it seven times. So this is a little dumpy little instrument uh, known as the racket. Um, so this particular version, the first version of rackets, did involve the uh, the tube being doubled back seven times, and uh, later versions had them actually doubling back eleven times into into this instrument. You can even even see the the, the staple, the the part that you blow into, is even curtailed there. It's it rolled up as well. There were three main sizes of these uh, because of the sort of size, etc. They don't produce a very loud sound. Um, so you might, if you were playing these outside, you'd have to be sit, sitting pretty close in the audience to be able to pick up what these what these sound like. I've seen Doncaster Waits play them with a, a consort of recorders. Um, the term actually also, because it was played round the dinner table, is possibly where the term sitting round the table making a racket came from. So uh, here we go with uh, three rackets. Okay, now we've gone all the, uh, the the wind instruments, a bit different fluted and reed wind. Uh, now we're going on to instruments that, that round about the Renaissance came about, uh, and these are the viols. Now they're not to be confused with being the predecessor to the violin because there were violins knocking about in the late Middle Ages and, and the Renaissance in various forms. Viols tended to be more played by the gentry than sort of Joe Smith, etc. Um, and again, the, the, they, are, they do have similarities to sort of like the modern violin family. Um, but yeah, in these case, what we've got, uh, what you've got, a, you've got a different view of it from different angles there because the, the, the back of the instrument is very flat. There's also no sound post carrying the sound to the heart of the instrument. There's no bass bar. Uh, they were generally between sort of uh, five and seven strings, but they settled on six for most of the sizes. There are about six sizes, but again, arguably, there could be more, could be less. Um, they were using gut strings for these. Um, when people talk about cat gut, etc., uh, it's not you, this, well, it's never been the gut of a cat, but it would be the gut of, say, a horse. Or a, or a sheep, or a, or an ox, or a cow, that type of thing. Uh, you've also got uh, what was called playing gut and non-playing gut. Now the non-playing gut was like not enough good standard standard to be a string, so it would wrap around the neck for frets. So a difference there again, the viols had frets, whereas violins didn't. Um, they also have shoulders, as you can see there as well, uh, where violins the violin family doesn't. Um, the sound of it, also the, the bow is played underhand, so instead of having your hand over the bow, like you would play for a violin, viola, double bass, cello, etc., it's actually underhand, and your little finger tenses the, um, the, tenses the horse hair as well. So uh, that's possibly where the term underhand um, comes from, because obviously if you think of when we were talking about Gothic last week, that said Gothic meant it wasn't the current way of thinking, Underhand is not the way that instruments are played now, so it's also maybe considered wrong, you know. A bit like the, uh, to quote General Melcher in Blackadder, uh, we're talking about the German spy, filthy hung weasel, fighting their underhand war, <laughs> type of thing. So uh, anyway, enough waffle. Here is the uh, the vials. Like I said, they have a, a nice sort of thin, very sort of straight sound, and the consort of vials goes quite nicely together, I think.
Okay, one of the most famous instruments, many people probably know these anyway, was the uh, lute. Um, there were lutes knocking around in the Middle Ages, but this probably was its heyday. Um, like I said last week, the earliest form of lute which we sort of borrowed from the East was the oud. Um, this point it is more refined. Uh, we now have double courses of strings, so basically each string has two strings. It's a bit like a 12 string guitar, that, that kind of principle. Um, and again, the kind of range between five and seven strings. Um, they would often be accompanied by a bass viol, uh, which I'll come on to in, in a wee bit. Uh, but here is the lute playing one of the most famous uh, Renaissance pieces, which I'm sure you will have heard. Right, sorry about the hiss there, but that's basically, that was off tape and recorded off vinyl. But yeah, obviously they didn't have CDs in the Renaissance, so that's best I could do. Um, right, okay. The new instrument, probably one of my favourites to be honest, uh, is the harpsichord, which is, I just think it's a fantastic piece of engineering. Um, and I just, I like the sound of it. Um, there were many types of harpsichord instruments that were plucked strings rather than the hammer action. There was, you know, the early form of a harpsichord was known as a clavicetherium, and there were spinets, you may have heard of spinets. Uh, but the basic, the this was sort of like the crowning glory of the, the plucked harp keyboard instrument. Uh, there would usually, they'd probably have at least two harps in there, and a different mechanical action, pulling different levers, etc., would indicate whether you had both harps playing or one harp etc um they eventually did actually take over from the lute uh because because of their versatility they had something known as a loop stop now what would happen with that you would either get this leather bound rail that you would lay on the top of the harp strings to kind of mute the sound or dumb down the sound or uh, a lever would be pushed that would pull a, a cloth over that particular strings of the harpsichord so i think lots of people have heard of harpsichords um so it is quite a rare recording we've actually like i said before the lute sometimes was accompanied well often was accompanied by the bass viol and then when the harpsichord took over the harpsichord was often accompanied by the bass viol uh, but in this case, you've got quite an example of, uh, quite a rare example of a, a lute, a harpsichord and a bass viol playing together. They all have their little solo piece, so we'll have to play all this excerpt all the way through. Uh, even the, the viol has a, a solo piece as well, because obviously don't forget it's got six strings, not four, so its range is uh, a lot greater than, say, what a cello would have been.
Okay, we had last week in the Middle Ages the uh, portative organ, which kind of sat on the knee. It was a uh, operated one hand operated the bellows like a like a fan opening and closing a book, uh, while the right hand played usually the right hand played the uh, the actual melody etc. This is a later uh, version of that and obviously a bit more adapted, a bit more uh, sophisticated. This is known as the positive organ. Um, I'll ask everybody to come off mute and I'll just ask anybody what when they think the first uh, organ, which century the first organ originated from. Mm. No, the portative organ was around before that. Any other guesses? No, not 17. No, no, no. Uh, um, well, either there's only me and you on the call, or other people have forgot to come off mute. <laughs> oh. No, uh Actually, the 6th, the 6th century, it was known as a, a water organ. Um, now, what, what happened was there's a drawing. It's a, it was a Roman instrument, so it obviously just before the Visigoths finished them off. Um, but it was, it basically operated on air like an organ would, but the water was there to add pressure. So, yeah, this was probably used for like a sort of, rather than playing melodies, etc. It was more like a sort of, maybe like a curfew instrument of, you know, giving particular signals. Uh, the drawing of it uh, suggests there's three men pedalling for the pump, but it's not clear historically whether it was three or six. Um, and there is actually a church in, Ed I think it's in Edinburgh, definitely in Scotland, where they do actually have a, a water organ still, or they, they have a, you know, a, a probably a slightly more modern version of a water organ where uh, they're, they're actually by the sort of sea uh, in this church and there are people in the cellar operating these pumps, etc. Now, I've had a go at uh, trying to recreate what a water organ might have sound like. So I'll just put this on for you. And uh, this is what I think a water organ might have sounded like. So yeah, yeah try not to be too critical. <laughs> what do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. Well, waste not, want not, I'll just, yeah. <laughs> I'll just start playing tunes. Um, right, okay. Um, so the positive organ, yeah, it wasn't quite a portable thing because it required about six people to carry it. Uh, you will see at the side of the keyboard, you had those little, um, little like buttons. These were known as stops. So if the stops, uh, you'll have heard the term pull out all stops, etc. Um, that's exactly what it meant. The more stops were pulled out, the more flutes per note would uh, come into play. So again, this is a fluted wind instrument. Sorry? Last time, last time you had something very similar. Yeah, that was the portative organ. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's the one that sat on your knee, but you won't want to put this on your knee. No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so again, you've got a wee bit more range uh, from what a, po uh, a positive organ can do. I've only got one example here of what it can do. This is this sort of more mellow uh, sounding fluted wind. Okay, now then, a, uh, a reed organ, uh, the more seasoned of us might remember a reed organ that you had when you were kids and you put, you put this fan on and then, yeah, and it played chords, you had chord buttons on the side and that type of thing. Obviously, this is a similar principle. Uh, 
But what you've got here, yeah, so it's reed wind. So tended, basically what tended to happen is reed wind could go lower, whereas fluted wind could go higher. Um, this one operates the bellows where a pedal is pushed to lift up the bellows and then gravity just sort of uh, keeps the uh, keeps the notes going, etc. And it's also, um, yeah, it has a sort of a nasally sound and it almost sounds like a, a consort of crumb horns, but you could probably understand why it's called a regal because of the, uh, it does have that sort of more powerful, well, regal sound. Okay, we're nearly at the end now. So uh, this one, the Renaissance organ, is kind of a culmination of both fluted and reed wind. It's quite a massive thing. You'll have obviously seen things similar like this into, into churches, probably more the Catholic Church uh, than otherwise. Um, and it's just got a lovely sort of great, there's some really great in combination of sort of the, the fluted and reed wind, especially at the bottom end. Uh, so yeah, let's have the, let's have the Renaissance organ. Yeah, what a great sound that one is. Um, really powerful. Right, well, we're going to close, if we're at the close now, uh, before I do the last little ex excerpt, obviously. Um, thank you for uh, for attending again and <laughs> and what have you. Uh, I, know, I will answer any questions if you've got any. I'm just really conscious of time again. Uh, but I'll also just say, if anybody sort of, one, you know, thinks this would be worth sharing with anybody else, either at work or, you know, if we, you know, or even sort of out, out of work that you might know anybody who might be interested or friends that might be interested in doing a, uh, a, a remote working socially distanced version of it on FaceTube or something like that, then, uh, uh, yeah, do, do get in touch. Uh, we've got next week as well, which will be sort of the uh, wrapping it all up, some bits of the 17th, uh, the, yeah, the 17th century and uh, some instruments that have survived further than that. Um, so I'm just going to close now with one more piece. Uh, you'll notice I haven't really done much in regards to uh, brass instruments on that. And one of the reasons I haven't is because generally people are probably more aware of brass instruments, etc., when watching anything to do with period dramas when involving kings and queens because you always had brass instruments announcing some you know the advent of some royal personage etc that's one reason i've done it oh, i've not really done it but the other reason to be honest is because brass musicians were gits <laughs> um what tended to happen was uh with brass instruments in any town they would form a guild 
and you had to be part of that guild in order to play your instrument. So it was quite an elitist group, and so it was quite difficult to get in, and the long and short of it is, if you went into a town playing your brass instrument and you were not a member of this guild, they would either destroy your instrument or smash your teeth. So, uh, yeah, not very nice, but yeah, <laughs> typical sort of, if you've watched the Tudors, that's, that's nothing compared to what, what the rest of them got up to. So, <laughs> you are sorry? I said charming. Yeah, oh, uh, I... <laughs> Well, actually, ironically, because my, my uncle was, uh, he was he was Salvation Army, and every sort of year, the armistice, he was the one that did the sort of like the, the uh, closing ceremony, I forgot what the, the, you know, the good night sound on the on the trumpet, and he, he could do that until recent years, and something's happened to his teeth since, but which means he can't play the trumpet anymore, bless him, so obviously, you do need teeth to be able to do that sort of thing. So I will just uh, end the call after this and just rem just close you with the uh, a trumpeting, uh, announcing, regal, royal, renaissance close. <laughs> <laughs>